but the meal here is accompanied by majoritarianism and the true nature of the political left. We'll hear about it all uh, from David Westling and a few right. And now we will hear from our uh, independent philosopher, David Westling. Uh, we're going to start with a quote from uh, Alexis de Tocqueville from Democracy in America. In America, the majority raises formidable barriers around the liberty of opinion. Within these barriers, an author may write what he pleases, but woe to him if he goes beyond them. It is only to utter a commonplace these last decades to say that the left is suffering from an acute identity crisis. The collapse of the Soviet Union was the culminating blow in a long sequence of reversals for the institutionalized left, <clears throat> the repercussions of which are still playing themselves out. In contemporary US politics, the left is associated with empowering the disenfranchised, but also, and perhaps more saliently, the big with big government and paternalism in general. Historically, it has been associated with the great challenge to entrench sources of political power, but I maintain that there is and always has been a fundamental incoherence in leftist theory from the time of the French Revolution to the Occupy movement of today, involving a deep tension between the left's two main thrusts, the championing of egalitarianism and the critique of authoritarianism. <coughs> The French Revolution is, log is the logical starting point for any comprehensive examination of the nature of the left. And egalitarianism found its most uncompromising proponent in the French revolutionary firebrand Gracchus Babouf, who went so far as to say, quote, society must be made to operate in such a way that it eradicates once and for all the desire of a man to become richer, wiser, or more powerful than others. Beruf occupies a position at this extreme egalitarian end of the ideological spectrum. But his philosophy was popular, popular enough to nearly topple the reactionary government in France in 1796, and can be seen as a logical consequence of the French revolutionary sensibility indebted to such critics of the old hierarchy as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. How did such a reversal of the values of the Ancien Regime gain a foothold? The antipathy toward the aristocracy on the part of proponents of the French Revolution involved many elements. But one fundamental element was certainly the hostility toward the rigid forms of social organization that the Catholic Church had promulgated through such formulations as the Great Chain of Being, which assigned a place in the hierarchy to every category of being from inanimate objects to God. One station in the grand scheme was an immutable affair. It was ordained by God, so went the adage that some were to rule, others to be ruled. This belief, so entrenched in European culture before the onset of the 18th century, all but evaporated, having collapsed in its own weight as the educated classes gradually absorbed the implications of the Copernican Revolution. But subsequent events proved that there was a failed flaw in this particular campaign against arbitrary privilege. Identifying the nature of this shortcoming was the focus of the young Hegelians, a small but influential band of German intellectuals in the 1830s and 40s. Their significance consists in their approach to cultural critique, the starting point of which was that the entire state apparatus claimed its legitimacy through its connection to basic religious tenets. Karl Marx stated in 1844 that, quote, the criticism of religion is the prerequisite of all criticism, unquote. And we'll be maintaining that it is the nature and scope of this key concept of religion that is the source of our long-standing difficulty in untangling the strands of thoughts, part egalitarian, part individualist, that make up leftist theory and practice today. In an effort at remedying this conf confusion, I will examine some of the important ideas of the more significant young and alien thinkers and the repercussions of these ideas down to the present day. They viewed the social situation in Germany in the 1830s as parallel to that which preceded the revolution in France 40 years earlier, 
and their attempt to chart a path to its recuperation formed the basis of modern humanism with its emphasis on embodiment over the life of the spirit. The terror which followed the initial phase of the French Revolution had taken the wind out of the sails of those who advocated radical change in the existing system. How did the revolution devolve into the terror? G.W.F. Hegel, in his monumental Phenomenology of Spirit of 1807, presented an account that gained wide currency in the early 19th century. The revolutionary conception of liberty with its Rousseauian idea of the, quote, sublime reciprocity between individual and general wills, unquote, is characterized as being so one-sided and extreme by Hegel as to be incompatible with a stable polity and to produce necessity only a fury of destruction. The key revolutionary figure, Maximilien Robespierre, summed up this attitude by his chilling utterance, proclaimed at the height of the terror, quote, to punish the oppressors of humanity is clemency, to forgive them is barbarity, <clears throat> unquote. Or as the former Jacobin author Sebastien Champfort rephrased the revolutionary slogan, liberté, égalité, fraternité, itself transmuted by the Jacobins into fraternity or death as be my brother or I will kill you. <laughs> In Hegel's view, the French revolutionaries enacted only a reductive, abstract conception of freedom. When made into a social policy, the fury of destruction of the Jacobin mentality can never produce a stable, stable set of institutions, but instead only the dissolving of any potential restriction on the general will it, as it was constituted at the time, which according to Diderot's assessment of French spirit, involved a strong element of resentment and indignation. In the heat of attack, this resentment and indignation became the dominant force, and other considerations paled by comparison. The revolutionary government, given its predilection towards enabling the fulfillment of this general will, was thus inexorably destined to degenerate into the fury of the terror. Hegel was then interested in creating a social theory that provided the highest degree of stability as was compatible with the highest degree of justice attainable. It was the state and its ultimate presupposition, necessity, that must be relied on, not in the Rousseauian sense of an equation of the individual and general will, subject to the social laws of sheer power, but as linked to Hegel's famous dictum, the rational is the real. One must make one's best attempt to answer the question, what is necessary in creating a just and stable society? Hegel indicated that the answer was to be found in the mechanism of the already existing Prussian state. This conclusion left very little latitude for those who found the prevailing state of affairs wanting. Was the left in its effort to eliminate arbitrary privilege, then merely to perish in the fire of unbridled absolute freedom? In the early 1830s, however, a new examination of the core tenets of Hegelian thought struggled for articulation. In 1835, a weighty tome of biblical exegesis, The Life of Jesus, was published by an obscure theologian, D.S. Strauss. Strauss skillfully played the rationalist and mystical interpretations of the New Testament against each other to question the Bible's historicity, which was, for Christians of the 19th century, the linchpin of its legitimacy. Strauss's book provided the template for the attack on the philosophical basis of religion and became for the left Hegelians the means to question the legitimacy of the state itself. This left critique involved what the young Hegelians termed the profanization of Hegel. The mysticism in his philosophical system reflected an oh, thank you, <laughs> intolerable tension in the cultural sphere and the need of the body to free itself from the strictures of the domination of spiritual life. To expunge this domination of spirit and fulfill the promise of the Hegelian equation of the rational and the real, one must in some important sense transcend the spirit of philosophy itself. This was the basic contention of August von Tchaikovsky, whose book, Prolegomena to Historiosophy, appeared in 1838. It was Tchaikovsky who insisted that, quote, the future will be an age of acts and not of facts, unquote. Ludwig Feuerbach, another prominent left Hegelian in his epochal work, Das Wesen des Christentums, The Essence of Christianity, of 1841, demonstrated that the omnipotent Christian God and the psychically officiated man were two sides of the same coin. 
This is the first appearance of the idea of the essence of religion as projective alienation. In Feuerbach's scheme, the affective qualities we construe as originating from God are only the projective essence of the best of the human. Love, compassion, justice, fortitude, wisdom, all fall into this category. Moreover, what God embodies, humankind loses. The human specimen is, as a result of this exchange, reduced to the status of a lowly supplicant who can then only grovel before the Almighty. Feuerbach put it this way. Quote, the easier life is, the fuller, the more concrete is God. The impoverishing of the real world and the enriching of God is one act, unquote. By fully realizing the perverseness of this state of affairs, humanity at the same time attains the supreme realization that it has within itself the spiritual qualities that it treated as only belonging to God. Man is to man the supreme, the true supreme being, as the Feuerbachian adage has it. The appearance of Feuerbach's essence of Christianity marks the effective beginning of contemporary humanism and the reaction in intellectual circles to Das Wesen, essence of Christianity, was nothing short of seismic. This really energized cultural left was convinced was a new chapter in the saga of the liberation of humanity. Karl Marx, who restated this sentiment in his famous pronouncement, religion is the opium of the people, was an ardent Feuerbachian at this point, but a series of intellectual earthquakes which would leave Marx and many others in the ranks of the German intelligentsia scrambling for a response was just over the horizon. The new intellectual climate created by Feuerbach's book gave fresh impetus to the work of Bruno Bauer, who began his career as an orthodox supporter of Hegel and rapidly developed an oppositional critique. Bauer's philosophical trajectory Proceeding both as a personal evolution of ideas and as a progressive disillusionment with the German university system between 1838 and 1842 became for the left Hegelians a paradigmatic example of the depth of the reactionary nature of the academic culture of 1840s Germany and by extension of the state apparatus as a whole. This early insight that the modern Christian state was an outgrowth of the despotic bureaucratic machinery of the Byzantine Empire broadened into the assertion that all extant legal codes are based on religious ones. Bauer had progressed from an orthodox Hegelian perspective, relying on the master's pivotal notion of Hofebung, which creates the conditions for mediation between thesis and antithesis, to the idea of a radical antithetics in which articulation of increasingly clear op opposing positions could progress to a culminating event, which Bauer termed the unmasking. This was Bauer's model of breach. In the actual crisis, the once progressive becomes the opponent of the new. It reveals itself as a response to pressure from opposing forces as the antithesis of progress. Bauer conceived of this drive of the unmasking as the triumph of self-consciousness over substance, which he saw as irreconcilable. This attempt by Bauer to elucidate the transition between the unquestioning faith of Christianity and a rationally constituted self-consciousness, which employed the technique of incessant criticism to root out all traces of faith and superstition, is fraught with some of the same difficulties on the plane of abstraction which plagued the thought of Hegel but it allowed him to work toward a theory of personal and social development, which might move a theory of personality beyond the twin obstacles of heteronomy, defined as controlling influence originating from outside the individual, on the one hand, and based self-aggrandizement on the other. Bauer pictured radical antithetics as the only form this personality, and by extension, the potential agent of change on the social level could take, which would be up to the historical task of confronting it, which in his view was taking on world historical dimensions by the early 1840s. He had lately attempted to put forward his own radical reinterpretation of the synoptic gospels, going significantly beyond Strauss's already skeptical account, in which he posited that not only was Christ not divine, but that he never even existed. This new interpretation of the Bible stories was to be the foundation for a class that Bauer proposed to teach in his capacity of instructor at Bonn. But the university's rejection of his proposal and subsequent developments, which involved legal action against him by the university, convinced him that the state had been unmasked, appearing finally as the reactionary force it truly was. 
the state, having meddled with the freedom of research by its actions against power, proved once and for all that it refused to recognize free criticism. Contrary to his expectations, the public proved its bondage to the forces of reaction by failing, as if hypnotized by the inertia of custom, yeah, right? to speak out against the state action against power in the spirit of free criticism. This, in his estimation, revealed a repressive triumvirate comprised of the state, the universities, and mainstream public opinion. And moreover, that all three had demonstrated definitively that he, they had excluded the principle of the triumph of self-consciousness okay. over substance yeah. from themselves. What pathway to change could there be in such circumstances? Bauer and Marx had been collaborating on a possible movement from theory to practice involving various coalitions between liberals and intellectuals, intellectuals and workers, and other combinations of relatively privileged and disenfranchised elements. Marx decided on a model which involved that aspect of the proletariat which could be identified with the forces of material production, the workers' proletariat. But Bauer found this alliance wanting. All the major constituencies had been put to the test and failed, he reasoned. The path from theory to praxis Francis would have to depend on a new class, not yet formed. Here you go, honey. In this, new, in this view, no sublation involving existing groups was adequate to show the historical task of large-scale transformation. So he became isolated, a revolutionary contingent of one, a happenstance which Marx seized upon with rubbish to demonstrate the superiority of his theory of historical materialism. Bauer remained convinced that social problems could be addressed solely by a change in individual consciousness, and that focus on the social sphere was unnecessary, even contraindicated. Bauer then drifted into irrelevance, while Marx explored the possibilities of social transformation using his model of historical materialism. Marx was himself deeply involved in his own articulation of the critique of religion. But Bauer saw Marx's overall effort as retaining key elements of the faith-based outlook which he retained from his grounding in Hegel. Bauer went so far as to characterize the entire socialist enterprise as, quote, irredeemably heteronomous, unquote, which, because the revolution <laughs> it portended, depended upon the proletariat as, as it was then constituted, determined by its sectional interests, it would remain a reactionary force. In his view, these sexual interests were bound up with the old forms of life dictated by the spirit of religion and were hopelessly enmeshed in the ancien regime value system. The spirit of criticism in its mature form, as Bauer saw it, was alien to the masses. To bring about real change, the concordance between forces allied in the struggle for liberation had to exist at the level of the critique. From this perspective, Marx had committed the Hegelian error of faith faith in the values of a proletariat which was still mired in a deep cultural atavism. The flow of history devours all maxims, and a socialism based in this uncritical workers proletariat would institute one inflexible dogma, that of the primacy of labor, and would lead to a withering away of all competing ideas, distorting all domains of life, and substituting an inflexible principle of equality for the free competition of ideas. This could only lead to a generalization of the idea of the proletariat, which would then bring about the hegemony of undifferentiated mass. The undifferentiated mass. But Bauer, Bauer could not overcome his inability to identify a contingent which would translate his ideas into practice. And his colleagues came to believe that his critical criticism, as it was called, had failed its ultimate test. The ability to apply its critical method to itself, to yield something that would have the power to change the existing order. The cue was sounded, and as if by some automatic mechanism of history, a new transformation of the young Hegelian critique appeared in the autumn of 1844. <clears throat> this was Max Stirner's Der Einzige Unsigned Eigentum, translated into English only in 1907 as the ego on his own a ferocious and apocalyptic attack on the young Hegelians and much of the Western philosophical tradition. Bauer's, Marx's, and Feuerbach's critique of religion had left the inner kernel of the religious impulse intact, claims German. Feuerbach had merely replaced the projection of God with the projection of man. One is only serving a new master, the Gattungswesen, or species being, a concept emanating from Rousseau's general will. 
Bauer's criticism mirrored the eschatological model of Christianity with its dichotomy between the purely human and the realm of the divine, and realm of the divine, engendering the split in human consciousness that was itself a major obstacle to drive for the corporealization of experience. And Marx was nothing more than a utopian socialist with positivistic tendencies, still trapped within the spirit of religion by his emphasis on social forces over individual ones. In Stirner's view, this placing of oneself at the service of humanity, whether based on Bauer's republicanism, Marx's privileging of the workers' proletariat, or Feuerbach's brotherhood of man, would lead to the same tyranny, that of the various controlling ideas over the living, breathing individual. In short, anything that could take the place of God as a highest essence can serve the basic religious impulse and tied one to the old ways of heteronomy. And so the litany of the rule of various concepts over the psyche of the hapless individual were paraded before the reader, the Stirner debunking each one in turn. Rationalism, morality, right, duty, and obedience all appear as aspects of the same pathological syndrome, reducing the individual to a mere servant of these conceptual powers. The global nature of this attack might suggest that Stirner was the ultimate nihilist, and he has been read in such a way by more than one commentator. Stirner, in a counter-argument against such notions, puts forward the notion of the non-moral good, a positing, of, a, cat, positing a category of actions and desires not moral in themselves, but which function as markers of value based on the individual will. Stirner quits the, treats the question of morality rather psychoanalytically when he says, quote, moral influence takes its start where humiliation begins. Yes, it is nothing more than this humiliation itself, the breaking and bending of the temperament down to humility. If I call to someone to run away when a rock is to be blasted, I exert no moral influence by this demand. One can help someone in need without making recourse to any duty to do so. The Kantian tension between duty and inclination is thereby resolved. Stirner's critique from a standpoint that combined an adamant insistence on a material starting point for his philosophy, the concrete individual, as opposed to some, quote, ensemble of social relations, unquote, as Marx, Marx's conception has it. Humanity, in Feuerbach's view, or criticism, in Bauer's view, with an ostensibly idealist conception of the historical process, the most fundamental chains of humanity are not economic but psychological made an impact on the European intellectual scene that was even more spectacular than that caused by Feuerbach's book less than four years before. In the immediate aftermath of the appearance of Der Einzige, some commentators offered qualified support, but as one might expect, outrage and condemnation were much more in evidence. One charge against Stirner put forward by Feuerbach was that his positing of Der Einzige, or the unique one, was itself just another concept that Stirner had sacralized. Stirner responded to this line of criticism by saying, quote, Stirner speaks of the unique and says immediately, names name you not. He articulates the word, and when he calls it the unique, adds nonetheless that the unique is only a name. He does mean something different from what he says, as perhaps someone who calls you a thing does not mean a little thing in general, but means you, for which he lacks a word. What Stirner says is a word, a thought, a concept. What he means is no word, no thought, no concept. What he says is not what is meant, and what he means is unsayable. unsayable. One of Stirner's principal topics is the basic presuppositions of classical liberalism, personified by the figure of homo economicus, economic man, was characterized in liberal theory as that storied figure acting from a position of rational self-interest which is to minimize effort while maximizing profit, but whom Stirner characterized as the cleric in mercantile clothing, who, taking its cues from the Protestant ideal, is in the process, at that time, of imposing its ascetic ideology on an entire civilization. Seen from a psychological perspective, homo economicus appears as the offspring of the liberal rationalist ethos, which is possessed of an insatiable drive to quantify by means of an all-encompassing economic rationalization epitomized by the ever-expanding drive for efficiency, 
The syndrome, which was examined so provocatively by Max Weber in his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, 60 years later. The problem from the point of view of the Schneiderian critique of Homo economicus is that the egoism of the capitalist merchant is one in which the sensuous person has been spiritualized. This emptying out of the sensuous contents of the person is directed by the individual for its own ends, but it's nevertheless a personal negation in keeping with the Pauline ideal, not I, but Christ lives in me. Through a complex series of transformations, the merchant cleric finds an equation between spiritual worthiness and economic success. This cardinal virtue, by means by the means by which this aristocracy of desert is attained, is service to the polity, and so obedience comes to the fore. In the Byzantine bureaucratic apparatus of the modern state and its analogs, this need for obedience takes on a significance that is almost physically real, and privileges itself of the impulse for individual judgment, the triumph of the overwhelming impulse for blind obedience. In the liberal rationalist system, freedom of contract is seen as the key to attaining personal freedom, but it depends on a calculus that hypostatizes rationality, with, con which, with consequences so far reaching that its disciplinary potential is still unknown. The idea of value was transformed by the coming of two dominance of economic man, and there is one in which has no real use for the aesthetic dimension of existence. Dostoevsky would later make the point that we do not build palaces merely to shelter ourselves from the rain. We would like to live in them. And for the cultivation of that faculty, which is far closer to a part than science, the utilitarian mindset of homo economicus is a distinct liability. Stirner's book, which used a left perspective, now redefined as the thoroughgoing critique of religion, to lay waste to the most cherished ideals of the then emerging socialist ethos, which they had done so much to formulate, was to these post-Hegelian stalwarts a wholly unexpected development. This was the intellectual climate in which Marx's The German Ideology was written. This text was abandoned to the gnawing criticism, criticism of the mice, quote unquote, as Marx characterized it in 1846, Thank you. and remained unpublished in any form until 1932. It did not appear in English translation in full until 1965. Most English language editions of this book have omitted the sprawling sensual section devoted to an almost line-by-line -line criticism of Der Einzige, which often crosses the line into ad hominem attack. It bears all the signs of a mind operating under a logic disturbing stress. It was here as well that Marx made the first substantive steps in the development of his theory of historical materialism. Looking back now, almost 170 years later, it seems rather easy to conclude that Stirner's impact on Marx at this juncture was decisive. As the cultural historian Nicholas Lobkowitz, in his important paper, Karl Marx and Max Stirner, puts it, quote, in fact, Marx's so-called historical materialism may be described, described in two different though complementary ways. On the one hand, one may see that confronted by Bauer's idealist extravagances, and later with their criticism by Stirner, Marx ceased to be a utopian idealist, and instead developed the foundations of a scientific socialism that enabled one to make predictions similar to those of science. On the other hand, however, and more adequately, one may say that instead of giving up his revolutionary socialist ideals, Marx advanced an interpretation of history in terms of which it became possible to retain the content of these ideals, without at the same time referring to their normative character. If one compares the doctrine advanced in the German ideology with the ideas that Marx developed prior to 1845, one soon discovers that except for a few minor points, they differ only in one major respect. What earlier had been described as an ideal is now described as a historical necessity. And the revolutionary rule of the philosopher has been replaced by a historical dialectic entirely independent of ideas. Stirner had forced Marx to give up his approach, but he had not succeeded in forcing him to abandon his ideal. <coughs> Marx simply translated his ideals into laws of history, unquote. Marx's search for a comprehensive formulation of these laws unsuccessfully his entire professional life. In this light, historical materialism reveals its grounding in a mechanistic Newtonian worldview, 
one that had a great deal of support in the world of science of its day, but which had been thoroughly discredited by 20th century revolutions in the world of physics. And as a result, Marxist apologists from Alfonso to Ardorno to Foucault have attempted to refine Marxist theory. Economic and psychological factors actually move in a complex interplay. According to this revision, one informing the other, but in the final analysis, there's still economics and its expression of the material production of sustenance that determines the superstructure of society. Yeah. As Marx puts it, while still in the formative stages of his material's conception of history, quote, as individuals express their life, lives, so they are. Therefore, what individuals are coincides with their production, both as what they produce and how they produce. Therefore, the nature of individuals depends on the material conditions determining their production, unquote. There just isn't any wiggle room in this outlet to admit factors which privilege individual concerns. And this focus on the external world at the expense of the inner one remains a formidable stumbling block to any attempt at synthesis. In many passages of his book, Sterner draws distinct contrast between socialism and the liberal capitalist ethos. More often, however, he emphasizes their similarities. This term for communism is more often rendered social liberalism than socialism or communism. At any rate, he uses these terms interchangeably. The main thing required in social liberalism, according to Stirner, is that in order to best realize the egalitarian ideal, we must live for each other. More than that, we must labor for each other. This is the basic meaning of the term altruism, coined by Auguste Hunt, the father of modern sociology. Labor becomes the hallmark of worth, labor for the common good. This ought reveals the essentially essentially religious conditions <coughs> of socialism. It employs self-renunciation after the Christian model, which has merely untethered itself from its original object, God, and substituted a new one, humanity or the proletariat. Labor, then, becomes humankind's calling in the same religious sense that Christianity uses the term, and society becomes that source from which all blessings flow. In such a way, egalitarianism the egalitarianism Rousseau of the Beauf of Marx arguably leads to that so-called leveling effect, which is perhaps the defining characteristic of the modern period. In the United States, majoritarianism is enshrined at the highest levels of jurisprudence. Just as Oliver Wendell Holmes once remarked, quote, if my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I will help them. It's my job, unquote. The safeguards put in place to ameliorate its effects are puny by comparison. American jurisprudence is, of course, rife with example, examples of the will of the majority's power over the legal system, of the Dred Scott decision being perhaps the most egregious. One lugubriously proffers that deference to this will is the price of stability. It's the ballot or the bullet. Our only recourse is to a theory of rights to protect us from the tyranny of the majority. But right, decoupled from its supposed urges in God, becomes a mere function of the governmental apparatus. And this leads to the inescapable conclusion that in effect, where there is no enforcement, there is no right. Majority rule thus acts in league with the oligarchy in a peculiar form of power sharing. One can only ruefully recall at such a juncture Thomas Hobbes' pessimistic assessment of the realities of entrenched power. Octoritas non veritas facet legion. Power, not truth, makes the law. The young Hegelian episode burned brightly for only about 10 years and then was buried in the tumult of the 1848 revolutions and subsequent reaction. For decades, the left was dominated by centralized authoritarian communism as it was exemplified by the Soviet Union and China. It took the theorists of the so-called new left in the early 1960s to refocus the priorities of a new generation of agitators but the critique of authoritarianism with uncertain consequences for the egalitarian ideal, who among their sources of inspiration look back to the more politically oriented exponents of artistic modernism and such philosophers as Friedrich Nietzsche in addition to Rousseau and Marx. But attempts at integrating Marxism, still seen in the more radical sectors of the left as an indispensable component of the effort against arbitrary privilege, with the new emphasis on the individual and in the writings of the new left and its affinities all run up against an incommensurability, extremely resistant to a resolution. 
Nancy S. Love, in her book, Marx, Nietzsche, and Modernity, describes it in this way. Quote, in varying ways, synthesizers of Marx and Nietzsche argue that the economic forces Marx hoped would liberate man now coincide with the psychological forces Nietzsche fears oppressing him. Modern science coincides with repressive reason. Class conflict coincides with mass politics. Capitalist production coincides with herd consumption. This presumed convergence suggests that historical materialism requires redefinition, and that a redefinition that adopts Nietzsche's analysis of man's cultural domination by ascetic psychology might explain why capitalism has not fallen from the weight of its economic contradiction. Yet combinations of Marx and Nietzsche also cannot direct the structuring of society. While each perspective is inadequate alone, together they become incoherent. They contradict, not complement one another. And this is not a dialectical contradiction. Attempts to combine them end in schizophrenia, not synthesis. Unquote. <coughs> one does adopt Nietzsche's analysis of man's cultural domination by ascetic psychology as an explanation of why capitalism hasn't collapsed. Historical materialism is obviated, since it's then assumed that psychic realities, and not the forces of production, are the ultimate determinant of material outcomes in society. This contradiction between Marx and Nietzsche, according to Love, hinges on the tension between production and play. Nietzsche argues that privileging production creates a crucial restriction on humanity's capacity for realizing its potential while well, Marx claims just the opposite. Nietzsche says in his book, Daybreak, quote, in the glorification of work, in the unweary talk of the blessing of work, I see the same covert idea as in the praise of useful impersonal actions, that fear of everything individual. Fundamentally, one now feels at the sight of work. One always means by work, by work that hard industriousness from early to late, that such work is the best policeman, that it keeps everyone in bounds and can mightily hinder the development of reason, covetousness, desire for independence. Thus a society in which there is continual hard work will have more security, and security is now worshipped as the supreme divinity." Unquote. Nietzsche's own roots in Jung and Galian thought are showing here. This attitude foregrounds individual psychology at the expense of more sociological and economic perspectives. And it seems to be intrinsic to the nature of this dichotomy that one has to choose between them. Highlighting the dynamics of this dilemma is Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, which harbors a decidedly ambivalent attitude between these two poles, the requirements of society on the one hand and the drive for personal autonomy on the other. In its opposition to the force of repression, <clears throat> it sides with the individual's drive for expression of the pleasure principle but in its privileging of the so-called reality principle, it contradicts itself in enjoining the individual to subordinate its quest for expression to the dictates of repressive civilization embodied in the dictum, functionality equals mental health. There have been attempts to rescue psychoanalysis from this contradiction, notably that of Otto Gross, the early disciple of Freud, who focused on the question of authority in the individual psyche. I'd like to dress Quote from Otto Gross. Whoever wants to change the structure of power and production in a repressive society has to start by changing these structures in himself and to eradicate the authoritarianism that has infiltrated one's own inner being." Unquote. Rose was certainly looking back to Stirner and Nietzsche in formulating this disentangling of the contradictions in Freud's theory of repression. Perhaps looking back specifically to Nietzsche's famous statement on the nature of repression. Quote, I did this, says my memory. I cannot have done this as my pride and remains inexorable. Finally, memory yields." Unquote. <clears throat> Freud's brag for Peter Gay draws out some interesting implications of this state of affairs in the following quote. Pride is the constraining hand of culture, memory the report on desire and thought and action. It may be that pride wins out, but desire remains humanity's most, most exigent quality. Unquote. Pride, or egotism, spelled T, is here opposed to desire. As a result, one is led to posit two egos. One, shall we say, subject to the wings of chauvinism, or in Bruno Barr's terminology, of the entrapment within a narrow particularity, 
and one which lies underneath the web rationalization of other defense mechanisms, which Freud identified with the id, but as he prophesied, quote, where it was, ego shall be, unquote. The trajectory of a possible political left that operates as the concept of egalitarianism is reconfigured, this begins to take on a definite shape. Herbert Marcuse, a prominent member of the so-called Frankfurt School and a self-avowed young Hegelian, who became a sort of patron saint of the new left in the 1960s and 70s, picked up the thread left by Gross and others who attempted to fashion a coherent theory of psychology outside the psychological establishment. His 1955 work, Eros and Civilization, sets out a Freudal Marxist conception of a possible progression to a non-repressive society. Marcuse stresses the need to reassess Freud's reality principle with its central focus on repression, believing it to be in a fundamental alliance with the capitalist mode of production. As certain forms of repression appear more and more suspect to the populace, however, the existing order in a democratic society must employ ever more sophisticated means of control, one example of which is something Marcuse called, quote, repressive desublimation, unquote, encouraging certain forms of meanly, meanly sexually oriented liberalization, which are in reality covertly designed to reinforce authoritarian means of social control, and also puts forward a compelling theory of mainstream psychology as an arm of the repressive state apparatus. Referring to a contingent he labels the Freudian revisionists, he writes, quote, psychoanalytic theory turns into ideology. The personality and its creative potentialities are resurrected in the face of a reality which has all but eliminated the conditions for the personality and its fulfillment, and finds its presupposition of presumed equality derived from the interactions of everyday life in liberal Russian society and the non-pathologizing view of the person and the functionality equals mental health supposition. One is left with a situation in which mere platitudes are asked to take on a therapeutic role, which enjoin the client to adopt the politely accepted standards as they evolve of conventional moral outlooks, to achieve a moderate level of contentment, a state of mind wholly in keeping with the liberal rationalist ethos. To summarize, the failure of the French Revolution induced those who wished for the fulfillment of its promise to determine the reason for its failure. Hegel's solution, involving the maintenance of a powerful state apparatus, seemed to certain progressive thinkers to end the promise of human liberation, not fulfill it. They found the reason for this to be inherent in the abstract nature of Hegel's philosophy, which despite his intentions had surreptitiously conserved the faith-based mystical spirit of religion. The succession of polemicists, D.F. Strauss, Ludwig Feuerbach, Karl Marx, Wilma Barr, and Max Stinner, criticized Hegel's mystical tendencies and attempted to replace this religious sensibility with a secularized view of self and society, using as their rallying point this perceived homology between the legal and religious codes. Seen through the prism of the young Hegelians, the project of the left appears as a drive for autonomy achieved through the disillusionment of the various species of God, which are peeled back layer by layer like an onion. The notion of precisely what constituted a religious outlook was a point of extreme contention among <coughs> these thinkers, and its seeming endpoint in the thought of Mike Sterner was, to say the very least, not universally agreed upon. This was the state of affairs as the revolutions of 1848 swept this episode into obscurity. The history of critique since that time has not materially advanced the overall argument behind, beyond this cataclysmic battle of ideas. This development of the critique of religion, which quickly became a critique of authority, pivots on the question of the tension between egalitarianism and the prerogatives of the individual. The left is by and large still occupied with the attempt to synthesize these two aspects of political theory, and as a result, it suffers from a persistent drift between these two poles, perpetuating the halfway state of affairs between the faith-based valleys of the Hushchen regime and that indistinct but tantalizing territory which lies beyond it. to, it always has an attempt to raise 
relevancy uh, or irrelevancy really, to the standpoint of uh, the faith. Uh, yes. Right. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but to me, majoritarianism is bankrupt because what happens if somebody actually has a position which is in fact absolutely correct? You're going to give away half of what's right by saying, oh, I'm going to cooperate with the majority. Uh, it seems to me that's a bankrupt position. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that's the American way. I mean, well, then isn't that our system? Then it's time for the deal. <laughs> but, but the other thing is, too, why do you refer to a Christian God when it's generally agreed between the leaders of the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity, that they worship the same God? Well, the Christian God is just the God that has informed the legal codes of our, our society. So. Yeah, it's the same, the same God you're talking about. Yeah. So why do you refer to him as a Christian God? <laughs> This was settled right here in Chicago in 1896 at some big conference of world religions where they all agreed specifically on this point. God is God. That's the same process that's involved in projection. Well, okay, I, we call then I, why, God. why do you refer to him as a Christian God? Well, I, I thought the I had The problem in the world religions you know, didn't paper that, uh, that's oh, The Christian God is the God that uh, but it implies that's it's different than the other two. Yeah. No, it doesn't really. It's just it's a, it's a, it's a cultural yeah. construct that we, are, as Americans, as Europeans, are imbued with. And so that's what we I have to, as, as members of that culture, to confront. And deal. We have no Jews or Muslims among us? Uh, well, it's a cultural construct, he said. Yes. I mean, it doesn't, you know, that, I'm not, you know, that, that's kind of a, a point that I don't find to be of overriding importance. I mean, it's not just the Christian God that is critiqued here. It's God as a concept yeah, that's totally generalized. Well, I so, my feeling is that's that, what I mean to say. that comment is 140 years out of date. Perhaps. Tim Bolger? Uh, can you tell me... I know you just give a very long speech, but can you just micro-encapsulate it into two or three main points, please? It takes too long for you to understand it. Well, yes, you might be right. Yeah, you, know. yeah. you have to condensate it to five seconds. I mean, I, I'm just looking for like a, a brief synopsis of what your whole main point was. It's so well, the point group. is that um, it's the the, uh, you know, the critique of religion and the critique of the state are pretty much the same thing. Okay. Um, and the critique of religion is the, the foundation for any possible critique of the state, and the critique of religion is much more far-reaching than has been supposed even by people like Feuerbach, who uh, posited the projective uh, split between uh, the lowly human being and God's qualities, that's not enough because then Feuerbach posited that what should take that place was humanity, but humanity is itself an abstraction. So we're still dealing with a series of abstractions that uh, have just as much dominance over the psyche as God in a, a more personal form would have. Okay, so and, uh, the only way to you know, you know, address that is to critique the concept itself as a, as a controlling idea. Okay, thank you. And, uh, you know, that's what the left really means. It's, my idea is that the left is usually thought of as something that is allied with socialism. But socialism uses those kinds of concepts in the same way that uh, where the, the Christians and other religions use God to uh, dominate the psyche of the individual mind. So, so to summarize then, you're saying that certain constructs that the left, like humanitarianism, is just a replacement for some of the constructs that 
have been made in the religious, like the Christian God and the Christian precepts yes. of the faith. Yes, that's it. And that humanitarianism is, a sense, the socialists want to replace humanitarianism as a religion versus Christianity or some of the other major dominated world religions, correct? Just know that there's no difference between a Christian conception of, you know, um, domination by the moral dictates of God and the, the dictates of a, a religion of humanity. All right. L.P. Anderson. Could you um, <coughs> expand a little bit on uh, Stanley Milgram's psychological experiments from 1960 that you listed oh, here? <laughs> Stanley Milgram conducted these things. They're considered kind of unethical experiments nowadays. Uh, he uh, didn't tell his uh, the participants that what he was really doing with them. I guess that happens uh, for some frequency in the psychological, uh, the scientific world. But um, he uh, recruited these people. To, he told them that he was doing an experiment on. Uh, the learning and memory. And so he uh, divided these people into two groups, one of which was in on the, the, the real idea that the uh, learner and the teacher who were not in on the, the uh, uh, original uh, the, the knowledge of what he was really doing. And so the, the, the learner was put into this box, <laughs> and the, the teacher had a control panel with gradually increasing electric shocks in the, in the, uh, that he would uh, administer when the, the uh, uh, learner would not in, uh, make the correct answer to a question that you know they was ostensibly uh, trying to teach the effects of uh, learning on memory, on memory. So when they got it wrong, they, you know, <laughs> get lower level check. If they got it wrong again, they keep increasing it. And there was this authority figure that was kind of off to the side, but he was, you know, in the, the basic uh, space that the, the teacher was in. And um, they start, they start getting really nervous. You know? Do I have to go on with this? I mean, he's he's, he's complaining. You know, he's they starting to keep bang on the wall. The, <laughs> the the uh, learner and uh, increasingly be vociferous about you know complaining that uh, that it was too much for him and the, the uh, teacher would look to the authority figure. Do I have to go on? Yes, you must go on. But he didn't say anything else. He just you know was, he was in a white lab coat <laughs> and he was the authority figure and they went on even though their their moral and uh, you know basic visceral response was um, want, they wanted to stop really, really badly. What was and, the ultimate outcome of those experiments? Well, 60% went all the way through to the end. To the, what was the end of it? What did they well, do? What did they think they were doing? Well, they thought they were participating in this uh, experiment on the effect of learning on memory, you know? But they actually went to the end and they thought they were killing the person. Well, or severely right? hurting. They, well, the, the, uh, the authority figure stated at the beginning that they were not being actually physically hurt in any sense, but just surface pain or some explanation like that, you know. And uh, they, they all went, 60% of them went all the way through to the end and gave all the shots that they could in the experiment because of obedience. Basically, they just were obedient to the authority figure, and uh, that was the real. Uh, you know. It's just like the cops teach us. Yes. Uh, uh, well, that, I guess so. Are <laughs> Yeah. So, would you say that authoritarianism as a psychological trait feature, which is very, very inherent, embedded in human nature, is the handicap for whatever economic structure man builds, and uh, more so, uh, and more so that there are some other uh, psychological barriers 
in the building of a universal, uh, uh, a left universal, really Marxist structure that we have we have ignored or we thought that we can uh, uh, go over. Uh, that's one question, but also what would you, what do you make of the left today, let's say like uh, presented in the Occupy the protest, young uh, protest movements? How would yeah. you compare it to, to your analysis, which is the old left? Yeah. I mean, the Occupy starts with grassroots, no leadership. I mean, they rebel against authoritarianism. So how would you reconcile that? Well, there's a new authoritarianism in uh, majoritarianism itself. Uh, the egalitarian ideal is a false solution to the problem of, of authoritarianism because it leads to another authoritarianism, the will of the majority. That you can't rely on that and, and get past these uh, structures of, uh, you know, uh, authoritarianism in the human psyche, in my opinion. So do you see the Occupy movement um, being stuck there? Yeah, I do, because I, they're, aren't they, they use a basically Marxist model, it seems to me, and it's somewhat modified with Foucault and other current thinkers, but you and people like that, but it uses the basic historical materialist model to explain uh, uh, you know, psychological states of mind. So it's, it's got failed. Well, let's see. Um, Charles? Yeah, you talk here, uh, Dave, about individual prerogatives. Are you talking about the right of the 1% to grow wealthy through the work of the others? talking about the rate of everyone to throw off the uh, authoritarian yoke that uh, is the only thing that's keeping the one percent in power because everyone is obedient to uh, the various structures uh, and, and the corporate structure more you know as a, a concrete reflection of the psychological <coughs> domination of their own psyches by uh, what Freud would call the superego Hey, Wesley. Um, who was the team of uh, Wilhelm Reich in regards to uh, Freud? Well, Reich, uh, he was a, uh, involved, he was a Marxist criti uh, criticizer of uh, early uh, ger uh, 1930s German society, where he, uh, he wrote a, a book called The Mass Psychology of Fascism, I guess that's what he had there. And, uh, that involves uh, the same kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a critique of authoritarianism in the individual psyche that uh, uh, is rooted in the patriarchy of the family as a cause of, of the authoritarian um, system in Germany in the 1930s. Didn't he also uh, uncover another force or something like that? Yeah, he called it the Oregon. Yeah. Right, Oregon mm -hmm. force. Yeah. Well, that his later work uh, he, he believed in the power of sex to just transform the whole psyche. And I, I, to my mind, he took that a little too far, but uh, um, and it's certainly got a, a great deal of truth to it. I mean, if you're sexually repressed, that's a, an aspect of an authoritarian um, control over the psyche, where you, you follow conventional morality of the Catholic Church or you know, other forces that keep people from exerting their own individual preferences in forming relationships. They from the dictates of the church and the state to uh, uh, keep the repressive structure intact, basically, in the individual psyche. Sid? Um, what would be the sense of overthrowing the 1% if people are inherently evil and can't change their idea? There will be no progress, no matter what you do. So how do you get progress in your school? And progress is inherent in nature itself. But human beings aren't necessarily 
basically evil, are they? I mean, well, that's what you're saying, or unless everything stays the same. No, I'm saying that humans have a history of being uh, entrapped in a pathological state of mind. Yeah, that's the same thing. No, it's not. Well, it's it not is. because that, that can be evil is inherent in that can be changed. That's what you're that's There's what a way saying. to throw off this. It's an idealist concept. I, I don't look at it that way. Um, well, it's not what you look at, it's what is. <laughs> <laughs> it's it. No, All right. Um, Bernie? Yes. Uh, what is your feeling about structure in society at all, and is it desirable to maintain at least some structure? And if it is, is there room for authoritarianism? And where do you draw the line between authoritarianism and excessive authoritarianism? Well, the police function will be the last to go in any liberated society, right? So, I mean, we have these authoritarian structures in our psyches, and only as they become uh, dissolved can you gradually leave off of those the structures that, uh, you know, I mean, they keep the monsters at bay. I mean, if, if you know the uh, film Forbidden Planet, yeah. 1956, yeah. at the end, right. they uh, asked the, the guy who got the, the brain boost and he was dying, what, what, was, the, what was it that he, he didn't see? Morbius, monsters from the id, John. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he the, the Morbius, had these forces in his basic uh, visceral psyche that uh, he had to exercise to cause revenge. And so uh, you know, as long as those those, uh, those forces are the dominant form of, of the psyche, then you have to have the repressive mechanism. But the whole idea of Freud's psychoanalysis is to address these mechanisms of repression to you know, ultimately liberate feeling from uh, its uh, need to, to have the psychological repression. I mean, there are there is some success in, in psychoanalysis, it seems to me, where uh, the, the, once you get back to trauma and understand some of the problems in, in your uh, background that cause you to repress things, some of the force of that repression is not necessary. So that that whole mechanism has to be extended as far out as we can possibly manage, and it's going to take you know 500 or 1,000 years, but uh, that's the process that I would say would have to be done to you know, change that state of affairs. All right. Let me follow up. So do you ever think we will be a society without structure? I'm kind of an optimist in that sense. I think it will happen, yes. All right. Martin? So you're talking about throwing off this authoritative society we have. What mechanism do you see that would implement that, given that the 1% has got a monopoly on the political and economic power? What mechanism would actually overthrow that without their compliance in some fashion? Well, the mechanism by which, you know, if you understand the progress of the left that the young and Galeans uh, examined. It's the gradual leaving off of religion that is the enemy of all authoritarianism. And as the, you know, more and more people throw off the religious yoke, authoritarianism will just dissolve of its own accord. Well, really? I think so. I don't know why I was so worried about it. Oh. <laughs> As I said, I think, you know, it's very, you know, a deep-seated phenomenon that humanity has never been without. So, Francisco. Uh, yeah, I um, think that we are confronting uh, a very difficult situation as far as to uh, protecting the environment from which we depend. And uh, the majority is not making the right decisions. Uh, we want to, call, as a majority, we keep demanding all these things that this system of uh, 
consuming and uh, stripping the land and so on demands for satisfying our, ch I think, childish demands uh, of poison plate and plastic shit. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, first I thought that you were saying we have no way out of there, but then you say maybe in 200, 300 years uh, we will find a way to control this authoritarian or the majority thing. And is that true? Is that what you're saying? That could be a lot quicker than that. You know? I mean, the 1960s in America and Germany and France and, and um, Italy and Britain was a, a, a major, the, the forces of authority were pretty much back on their heels, it seems to me, at that point. And it was the fact that, like for instance, in Paris 68, they had a hard time resolving the, the whole individual versus socialism question. And, to me, that was one of the main reasons why it failed. That uh, you know, they used a Marxist model, and it just it would have instituted it. People, a lot of them, I think, understood that it was just going to lead to a, a, a tyranny of a, of a majority that would make the United States version pale by comparison. It would be more like North Korea or something. So. Uh, that was a real pivotal point, and there's no reason why that couldn't come back. You know, it, with the, one of the problems to me is that we work so much now. People can't can't don't have to like I said in uh, that Nietzsche quote. Uh, you know, work is the best policeman, and as long as you've got work that's just occupying people's minds 70 hours a week, 50 hours a week, it's really hard to work on yourself and figure out what you want. Yes, let's see. Uh, Charles, you had your hand up before Bob. Well, Bob has another question yet, though. Let me go with the oh, big guy. Yeah, what, is, uh, what is Hegelianism? <laughs> the will. Well, Hegelianism is the, the philosophy of Hegel, basically. Which is, what is that? Dialectic. <clears throat> well, yeah, it's, his basic idea was uh, to, uh, he, he had this, what he really wanted to do was keep God in the picture by thinking that he could build a model of the uh, gradual unfolding of God's spirit in the process of history, which he thought of as dialectical, involving thesis, antithesis, and synthesis over thousands of years, that it is gradually moving towards this rationalistic articulation of the spirit of God that uh, will eventually, uh, and even he thought in his own time was achieved, uh, create a, a state of affairs that uh, would be equitable for everyone in terms of justice. free. Well, he was wrong, all right. <laughs> I think he was extremely wrong. It was tragically wrong. All right, uh, Gene Horner. Uh, I admit I'm kind of at sea here, but I heard some of the things you said sounded a little bit close to anarchist. Yeah. <clears throat> Stand the Kilkeas Church. Yeah, that's, it's an anarchist system because, um, you know, the ultimate uh, dissolution of authority is the anarchist. So, uh, Thank you. The idea of, of the law, as, of the rule of law, um, which is our only bulwark against the monsters from the id at this point, is uh, a necessity in the current society, but with the uh, idea of the gradual leaving off of the authoritarian structures of the mind, uh, gradually uh, those appliances uh, on the law can be reduced or eliminated. Charlie had a question. Well, let's see, uh, Bill West? Uh, is collective judgment authoritarian and is uh, labor organizing, is that authoritarian? Or individual? 
uh, it depends on whether you grant the uh, rank and file the freedom to, you know, not go along with the, the majority decision. I mean, what happens? Is, uh, uh, in How many unions do that? Well, they all do that, but they don't do that. The AFL CIO. Basically, dictate terms to the rank and file. So yes, uh, unless the, the uh, union is uh, one where the individual has the right to pull out, and, uh, he only participates in insofar as it meets his own needs, then that's the only union that's not. You're working work. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if the work suits the is something that the, the individual freely chooses, then 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 it's not fair to I mean, it's kind of you know, with the uh, American system, <coughs> there's such a, a reliance on uh, the uh, authoritarian governmental system to make everything work anyway. It doesn't do well. yes. All right. Um, Which is the structure of Darwinism. <coughs> you can't achieve anything without the structure. So, so how could anarchism possibly work? Well, there would be structures. It just wouldn't be yeah, a top down no, structure. Be enforced. He thinks of chaos, not anarchism. <coughs> yes. No, anarchism is, is cooperation, um, but it's, it can't be a cooperation that's, that's a. a you know, a, a Marxist sort of cooperation in which you know, places the, the uh, needs of society above the needs of the individual. That's, that's the basic difference. Sorry. Well, yeah, there will be structures that yeah. anyone, you know, any kind of structures that people will want that preserves the individual prerogatives. But the structure itself has to be worked out by people. And you have to have some degree of hierarchy, but not to the extent that they have power. Um, well, that's difficult to say, but uh, maybe some uh, minimal forms of hierarchy would have to be retained, but uh, it's just a matter of <laughs> maximizing individual prerogatives and, and realizing that uh, you know, they have, yeah, uh, if you've got a capitalist system or a socialist system, they all depend on various, you know, coercive systems of, of uh, control. And, uh, all right. Bob Matter? Yeah, isn't, uh, isn't capitalism the only system that stands out apart from all the other ones? Because, in fact, there, uh, there is no... Uh, Authoritarian control that the decisions are left to the marketplace, to the consumer, whereas fascism, socialism, communism, all those other isms, they all involve state planning in some respect or another. Somebody deciding who the people are they're going to go to school and who's going to learn a trade, deciding what products are going to be made and how many and what color and all that. Those are all decisions now that are removed from the people and taken over by some apparatchiks of the state, some government people. Yes. So that is authoritarian. Capitalism, though, that is pure freedom, where the market determines. The, it's the end, end, and, and who knows better than the customers? That's why they, who can, who's, who's best to decide what color or size or shape of the product should be, rather than the marketplace giving that immediate feedback every day with consumers voting with their dollars. I mean, uh, isn't, isn't it, aren't, aren't I correct in saying the, market of the ultimate freedom? Well, you know, market forces might be, you know, something that could be compatible with some, some form of anarchism, but the current form of capitalism has very little to do with free markets. <laughs> well, 
Well, I don't know about that. I don't know. No, he doesn't our know. He doesn't know. Our our what he thinks. That's what happens. Our problem is we can't land an Certainly, I mean, we're, we're, we've got, you know, we pretty much got three um, trades, not as good as we, uh, we should have, but. Yeah. Well, at any rate, we have all, it's based contract. on the Protestant ethic. Man. We can operate in our own self-interest for the most part. I mean, it's, it's pretty good. It's not it's perfect, but it's certainly pretty good. Well, I don't call it pretty Debates good. Debates uh, action of the of the, our program yeah. comes a little later. Uh, Bob, Charles. Yeah, I, as a union guy, don't the people have to engage in majoritarianism to combat something like the coercive capitalism? Don't you think capitalism is coercive, or do you think it's it's uh, benign and benevolent? It's coercive. What do you do when, when confronted with capitalist exploitation of corporations? Well, we don't give a shit about anybody. Conserved in, uh, Kind of, uh, what do you do well, with the multinational the corporation? Take back the money. <laughs> <laughs> the authority. The law is what keeps the, the uh, money in their uh, coffers. If the law is not something that actually exists, if it's just a leak of a religious concept. All right, I'll switch it around. You, you got in here, you say, our legal system defers to the majorities. Have you ever tried to, have you ever seen the, the rules of what you have to do to organize a union? It doesn't, it doesn't defer to the majority. It's just that, you know, if you have to keep in mind that majoritarianism is going to have certain effects where um, that will of the majority, the, the psychological characteristics of the majority creates its own tyranny. Only until 1935 could we have something called a union or a voice of the majority. That's a long time in the history of this country. And then it was taken back in the Taft Art for 12 years only. The Wagner Yeah. So where is our legal system deferring to the majority? Mr. Bolger? All right. I would like to know what your thoughts are on the character John Galt. Oh, John Galt. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of classical liberalism. I don't really differentiate Rand from uh, J.S. Mill or you know, the other proponents of classical liberalism. And I, commented pretty extensively on classical liberalism in my paper. Um, Can you use the mic? It has a religious dimension to it. Oh. Yeah, it has a religious dimension to it that uh, is uh, as restrictive as uh, a lot of the stuff in Marxism. I mean, yeah, John Galt gets a certain amount of freedom, but then he has uh, 10,000 workers who don't have the right to, you know, and the way capitalist structures are set up, one person is free and 10,000 others are enslaved. So okay. that's Can, no solution. As, as a follow-up, what do you think of the present form of globalization? Uh, globalization is a great enemy to the, the spirit of the individual. I, I, it's just going to increase the collectivization of societies around the world. Can you repeat that? Globalization is what? It, it's a great enemy of the of the individual. I mean, it's, it's Globalization is an enemy of the individual? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Would you agree that, at least under some circumstances, that the philosophy yeah, yeah. of Adam Smith, that is, you know, the valve of him, Global, steering power, market decisions, yeah. is actually consistent with uh, near anarchy? You have any because results? no one is ordering anybody to do anything in particular. You know, it's against, against the it, um, Carol, I'll say yeah, I think yeah. So why why do the leftists sort of say oppose Adam Smith's philosophy when well, so because many because of the concentrations of power that happened in capitalism that you know 
Yeah, but they also happen in uh, socialist systems. The yeah. recent communist system in Russia, a system of set quotas and production. We're going to build so many miles of nine inch concrete sewer pipe and so many miles of 30 inch diameter sewer pipe. We're, we're laid down as fact, regardless of whether it was really needed by the society or not, leading to all kinds of waste and so forth. I thought I had, you know, made my feelings clear on the nature of uh, authoritarian socialism. That's a greater evil than we're going to get. You do agree that that's a greater evil than Yes, I do. Okay, good. Yes, uh, Mr. King, are you familiar with a gentleman named Bob Williams? Uh, okay, he has uh, something that's called Psych-K, to deal with muscle testing. All right, if we are out of questions, we will move to our... Oh, yes. No. I even have one more question. Okay. I, I'll, I'll be real quick. Um, I came across an individual who, uh, he's a political scientist, and I don't know what science and politics have to, anyways, I asked him, um, the sole purpose of government should be just protection only, and how can a government function on that principle alone, and just that principle alone, of Protection only and a protection only budget. that we take from the rich and give to the poor. Would you classify me and use you as the term an authoritarian socialist? Those are your needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, should we take, ask the rich to share or? The rich have gotten their ill-gotten gains and have gotten away, right? So, um, it's theft? Theft, yes. <laughs> By the power of the state. If you don't have a, a powerful state apparatus that's in league with an authoritarian structure, you can never have these kind of countries. The power right. that we let people amass such great influence of wealth for other people. What about making a product or service that the, that the market likes and responds and buys? Well, the the product and service is superior. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Make a good that's product. Yeah. Most of the big rich people got that way. That's quite Sam Walton because he said Walton because he offered products at a lower price and a better service. That's because no, he got rich because he got children working for him in Asia. Yeah. yeah. All right. I have a question. And that is, uh, why is the liberating God that brought the uh, Hebrews out of Egypt uh, a <laughs> slaving God? Uh, why, why is it that uh, Marx's uh, humanism uh, is characterized as uh, an authoritarian. But because he advocated uh, a, a form of socialism that you would uh, have to characterize as authoritarian. Why? When? When? The, kill the what Alec. is the, the those, Marxian those, form of socialism? Because of the organization of the workplace, basically. You know. What is He's a, a free association of labor. But it doesn't work out like that. Oh! Factories have to be, in a, a Marxist system, factories are associated, uh, uh, 
configured in a way that uh, is top-down authority. You follow the dictates of the, the uh, couple size, basically. Mm. I mean, there's no, the worker has no uh, autonomy. It's, no, uh, it's a system that uh, follows the dictates of the central planners. I know. You wish to go first, but you can't. Centrally planned economy, Marxism. Uh, but I'm sorry, but that's not something that uh, he, he uh, indicated that the uh, commune, the Paris commune, uh, was indicated the worker worker control over uh, production, but he certainly. So that was a pretty anarchistic, well, a pretty free uh, organization of production and distribution. It was also somewhat egalitarian. Yes, it was. Well, any concept that involves the dictatorship of the proletarian is going to be egalitarian. Well, I didn't have, yeah, you know, you know. Didn't. That was his central thesis. Well, that there should be a dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat was to, uh, to replace a dictatorship of uh, capital or the market or, or uh, the monopartist uh, uh, empire. So I. But how would you organize such a society? Well, people were organizing. That was what was precious to Marx and uh, the, uh, the communist, the Paris communist. Yes. Anyway, uh, Marx was a communist. Okay, yes, Charles. There's one last one here. You said that there's lefties have tension between their egalitarian notions and their libertarian life. I'm a lefty. I just really don't have any Tea Party tensions, <laughs> conflicts that I embrace. What exactly are, are you saying Occupy Wall Street is the same as the Tea Party? No. Uh, tea Party is a, is a classical liberal Sort of, uh, organization, it's a liberal it. organization? Classical liberalism. Classical liberalism, Charlie. Liberal. Charlie Largell liberals. Yeah. Like Tom Paine. Yes. Mm. George Adam Smith. Swan liberals like Jan Schakowsky. Uh, Dennis <laughs> Kucinich and Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, thank you. Well, that's social bond, but not the rebuttals. Let's go to rebuttals, Brom. Okay. Last question. Cubs or Sox fan? Rebuttals to make. How many have Ayala? One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm just experiencing too much tension right now. Five. Okay. <laughs> 20 minutes each. At least five minutes. Okay. All right, Frank, you're, we're on. Francisco. Five minutes and uh, go. Let's have at it. Let's thank our speaker tonight. I want to compliment him on a really good job and a really good organized speech. Thanks a lot. Well, to me, it was uh, a pleasure to hear very. Uh, the analysis of the political life. I have not uh, learned much about philosophy or politics. I was involved in my work. Um, I escaped from a bad situation from my own country. I landed here and to survive. I had to work my ass off, being fucked over and over and over. So. It was a learning process, so I know, I knew personally I was being fucked. But I didn't understand how the system was. Um, I understood that religion was an oppressive force, 
because I come from a Catholic country. Um, there were a lot, a lot of things happening, not only in my own life growing up there, but also in the history of the country of how the uh, church was uh, a nefarious institution that kept the natives quiet when they were being fucked uh, and still doing that. Um, it came to a point where a woman was put under the firing squad in Argentina uh, in spite of the Constitution at the time forbid the execution of a woman when she was pregnant. And this woman was executed because the Pope demanded that they go and execute her. And why the Pope was so interested in her to be executed? Because who having pregnated her was a priest. So, <laughs> instead of cutting his balls, they killed her. That's, uh, if you want to look it up in the history, Camilla uh, was the daughter of a big, powerful man in, the, in one of the provinces. And uh, so, in any case, that uh, we, we cannot have any more of this debate whether religion is a positive or not. It's, it's just. <laughs> and it's enslaving, it's keeping people as immature children who are still asking daddy to help them to solve the problems that they have to solve themselves. So it's a, it's a big thing. But my concern now is more of a, how do we come, up, come out of this mess that we are in now? A few hundred years ago we discovered the fossil fuels, which give us a, a, a power that we never imagined that we could have, the power of all that energy that allow us to make all the things that we did, uh, flying airplanes, have cars, but at the same time strip the earth back, strip the earth with no concern of anything, no concern for the animals, no concern for people, no concern for the future. And now we come to a point that if we don't change this course, what we're leaving behind to the future generations is a real mess. It's a mess that is getting to become obvious to us because of the changes that we are seeing, more a stronger uh, climate, uh, floodings, strong droughts, big rains. This is so all understood, predicted scientifically. And we still, our dear idiots up there, they still deny that we are doing this. They keep telling us, you know, it's something periodically happening to the earth. Well, it's not. And we have to wake up. But with the uh, religion on our background telling us, believe in that bullshit up there and don't worry about a thing, people are just unable to react, to take control of their lives, to take control of what they should be doing. So I, I, was, I, I ask you, uh, because you mentioned in two, three hundred years we will come out of this cloud. But that's not enough. We are, we are in big doodle. The next, the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years are really, really important. And we are not reacting fast enough. Thank you. Good going. Yeah. Um, I found the speech uh, very idealistic and very metaphysical. Somehow, we could change your ideas and come across the right ideas, we could change society. Actually, the opposite is true. If you look at history and progress, it's not dependent on people's ideas, but on their material conditions. That's where uh, ideas come from. Progress is inherent in matter itself. From love evolution to the amoeba, the plants, animals, to man, 
to slavery, feudalism, to capitalism, to socialism. Why did uh, socialism fail in Russia? Because they had the wrong tactics. It was a very backward country, extremely backward, most backward in all of Europe, and it didn't have the basis to change the conditions of people's ideas. And they made big mistakes by not keeping Lenin's MEP, the new economic plan that he had, in order to boost the economy so they could start the five-year plans. And they depended just on the five-year plans. But like in China, where they, they recognize the fact that they can't build socialism in such a backward country, they have to go through a phase of uh, uh, more or less uh, a hybrid economy by combining socialism and capitalism to build up the economy. And they did build up the economy quite a bit in about 30 years or so. They're second in the world industrially. And they've overcome some, some of the contradictions of capitalism because they don't have recessions and depressions. Now that's progress, and if you want the progress right away in order to change people's minds, that's utopianism. It takes a long period of evolution to achieve that type of progress. Right now they're growing about 7.5 to 10 percent a year, and they brought, brought out about maybe two-thirds of the population, or maybe a little less, out of poverty. They still have a long way to go, but they're making tremendous progress. And if you want to overcome people's ideology, you can't do it with ideas, you have to do it with change. And the people themselves have to bring on that change by recognizing that people are agents of change. And change itself, like it says, is inherent in, in uh, nature. So by using the right uh, methods, and analyzing the uh, economy and, and every other thing in society and try to overcome the contradictions in it, they arrive at a higher level of consciousness until they point, uh, well, you'll have a better society. But it's not going to come all at once. It's not because uh, people's ideas change. It's because they're changing society, and with changing society, they also change their consciousness. Uh, people, or humans, are agents of change. Until they know the laws of change and how to bring it about, they won't succeed. So at every different level, they have to understand the laws of change and how to bring it about, and then they come to a higher level of consciousness. Consciousness is constantly changing. If you look back to slavery, for instance, a black was considered about one-fifth or three-fifths of a person. Now you have a president that is black, a woman that is secretary of state. So consciousness is constantly changing. But to change to a level where they could do away with the state or coercion, that will take a long time because Capitalism itself always tries to overthrow the system that uh, makes progress. And uh, like I said in the other speech, in Russia they had something like 250 bases around them, surrounding them. And when, uh, when uh, Russia put one base in Cuba, we almost had a war. So you have to have coercion to keep down the capitalists. This is perfectly natural until you have a system worldwide where capitalism is done away completely. Then you could go into socialism or you could go into anarchism, whatever you like it, where people control their own destiny. And they understand the laws of society. You have planning, you have planning boards, you have things that bring you forward, constantly bringing you forward. <laughs> Thank you.
brings us forward, man. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, very interesting. Of course, he lost me on most of the points because it was so abstract and so intellectual that I got totally lost. But I grabbed up a few threats uh, by his demeanor and uh, knowing a few people that I've, I've talked to. I would use the word anarchism. There's uh, somebody here in the college, not today, but that claims to be an anarchist. Uh -huh. And I heard one guy from Occupy Chicago talking about Occupy Chicago, and he said he was an anarchist. So, uh, of course, anarchy, uh, you, you always think of the uh, 1890s when somebody was flinging a bomb at somebody else. Uh, but there's another form of anarchism that uh, doesn't uh, use violence at all. That reminds me of what this kind of what the speaker said is again his demeanor and what he said is nonviolent resistance. He didn't mention that. He didn't mention that at all. But that grabs me because I read this book of, of Force More Powerful. And it talks about various forms of uh, nonviolent resistance. And the two things they usually have in there are to withdraw consent. And I think that was a little bit implied in his, the speaker's presentation. Withdraw consent. You refuse to do what the government tells you to do. And the second thing is you replace the government by replacing services. You want to see how that works? Grab that book, uh, "A Force More Powerful" by Ackerman and Duval. That covers a lot of it. So, uh, it get, you know, I need more structure than that. <laughs> like I say, it's hard for me to. I, I I'm a structure person. I want control. So it's hard for me to uh, grasp that. But I hope this be speaker's uh, ideas uh, come to fruition at some point. Thank you. Raj Patel. Years back I went to a speech uh, about Chandamon uh, Kuntak Pati Universe. And I went and in the whole presentation was mathematical. And I didn't understand. <laughs> so, this was uh, I came when I was 25 years old and I don't, I don't know any of those people you name, except Karl Marx. <laughs> so, that's good. Uh, it's, it's it's now, yeah, that's fitting. That's what happens. <laughs> the, some of us uh, in a society, there are leaders who work hard to try to get ahead. And no matter what you do, they're going to get ahead. And there are going to be lots of people who rather not take the trouble. So there is a stratification of people, 1% and 90%, 99% or 95%. It, it takes place, uh, okay. it takes place in, a, in a all situation. Look at a galaxy. I mean, there is a black hole and there are lots of stars and everything is there. I mean, that's why the universe is structured. Uh, the, most people have an impression that top 2% and 3% are the same as the rest of the 97 or 95%. But that's not true. Because, Without those three percent, rest of them, wheel of the doesn't move. I'll give you an example. A, a, a plane was uh, fell down in a desert. It's what this was moving. And uh, only one guy knew how to how to fix it. Everybody else did not know. And there is limited water, so they rest on it. And when he was, he was sleeping and he wake up in the middle of the night and he took a water. And everybody woke up and said, hey, look, you stole water. He said, look, I need a water, I was thirsty, I need a water to think, 
do you want me to have water or do you want do you don't want me to fix the plane so he gets it he gets it the the problem we have we want society to work to the extent we want it to work is we get to elect leaders who we want and get up to them to do what you want you know don't let them don't worship them what i hate is that those people who elected barack obama are worshiping him and that that sucks because they didn't produce anything they're not they're not criticizing him hey guy you know the, the, the finally finally gay people started making a trouble for him then he gave he gave a little you know so so the the way to work is there for 90 that 93 95 percent is there you need those three percent or five percent okay there are not too many steve jobs or uh, uh what do you call it uh, this group on guy or the that uh, microsoft guy there are not too many of them and never never going to be no matter what you do okay so barack obama was absolutely wrong last when he gave a speech is that that uh, that the government supports rich people get rich because of the government that's not true that's not that that's not true the bar microsoft guy that's not true about steve jobs that's not true not some other guy that's not true for henry ford firestone nobody's true sure is there society did it okay so rail so many railroads were built okay and they were built by private companies so this idea of that 90 that we are going to have a utopia when 97% everybody 100% going to have the same right and same situation is not going to happen it doesn't happen in any society it doesn't happen in a monkey society it doesn't happen in a in a lion society it doesn't happen in a hyena society it doesn't happen that is not the way nature is created okay so let's forget about that okay and a, and a, let us try to get create elect the best leader we can and uh, and try to get what we want in the american if american society is going to work we need a person who we have to be solid a we need a leader who is solid and oriented sir okay who knows how to get along with people who knows how to talk you know who how to get people together and say okay come on let's do together let's solve the problem and this guy we have is not doing it thank you solution oriented yeah uh, that was we a huge overtaking uh, undertaking uh, maybe overtaking i would have a seminar you know a full seminar full semester or full year <laughs> um but uh, yeah very very um very very interesting at least to me uh and i don't think that we can ever really eliminate authoritarianism from humanity uh not in the next million years at least but uh, uh we can manage it we can learn i agree with you that we can learn how to manage it and um increase free thought and here is the <clears throat> here is some of my thinking about uh why is it so um why is it replicated in every society and um throughout history to different degrees uh those we have a you know they we have an embedded need for um for organization and through so socialization basically those means are replicated uh and passed on it's child raising um and it can differ it can differ i know that uh my children were uh brought <coughs> up in a very permissive way uh, encouraging creativity and both of them are pretty close to the anarchist profile and doing very well and very productive <laughs> people uh so uh, socialization is something that we will need and education are our keys here um now 
you mentioned, uh, I think Sid uh, mentioned that consciousness has to precede a change in structure. Just the oh, a change in structure. Okay, the, uh, the truth is that it can go both ways. A change in structure can... Dialectical. Yeah, and, uh, and change in consciousness could. Now, I believe that we can change consciousness to some degree of authoritarianism. If you take... Floyd was uh, a, a good example, and I think the, the id ego and the super ego were a metaphor also, not just for the individual psyche, but for uh, the authority, which is the superego, the id, which is freedom. And he, and, and he was encouraging people to have a healthy ego that will manage those forces. So if society will learn to uncover, uncover the subconscious propaganda, uh, subconscious uh, authoritarianism, um, there is a better chance of, of managing it. As long as it's covered, there is no. Uh, to give you an example for, for the uncovering is uh, Godlier uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the basis of capitalism is the uh, excess value, which we call profit and accept it as profit, but actually Godlier calls it unpaid work. Okay, so uh, the way we think, the terms which we think have to be uncovered to see where we are um, sheepishly uh, uh, following the, uh, you know, some, some authoritarian and unconstructive ways, I, I agree with you. Um, now, Chuck, uh, you asked about um, the organization, the union, uh, um, and um, who is it that said that we, we must have a uh, hierarchy? I think you, Mac. Um, but uh, the, the, the idea to replace, the, the, uh, the, the substance to replace is hierarchy with division of labor and pluralism, which is more equalitarian. And in an ideal, and that would be very difficult again for us who are so uh, so uh, programmed to to put to give priority to discipline and obedience. Now, it it, it is uh, definitely a priority in education socialization. So uh, the the issue is that people have different roles, but they don't take the power with the role, but it is the role to, to be, uh, All right, well, uh, I want to thank our speaker for coming up here and uh, sort of being a, a punching bag uh, for some of us. Um, most of what you talked about was was over my head. I'm not really familiar with, with a lot of that stuff. I'm, of course, I'm a little bit familiar with Marx, um, Dostoevsky, and a couple of things, but not uh, Hegel and, and uh, all that stuff. But uh, but I got a, a little bit, of, you know, you know, given the, you know, enough time and a little, you know, a little bit sunk in, like about the authoritarianism. Uh, but I see a lot of uh, a lot of you know errors. I think in in the general thinking of not only of your own but of all these these previous writers and Marx and I think some of our speakers like Sid here said the reason why socialism is a failure and has failed always always has failed always will fail is because is because the it, they get the whole thing is wrong the whole concept is wrong the the mainspring of human motivation is self interest and not the not the not the collective. That's why and unions. that's why we have. That's why. That's why every every communist uh, state has always had millions of people dying in uh, famines and stuff. You know, 20, 30 million people. Russia, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. Go right down the the you know the thing. You know, it's because people aren't going to work hard when they figure, hey, the other guy's going to work hard. We're all getting the same amount, so why should I work hard? And then nobody works hard, and you know, nothing's produced. So. <laughs> 
you, so you've got to have, you know, so that's the thing. And when you have uh, uh, planning boards and things like that, all government is a drag on the economy. It's all overhead. So that means there's going to be less. The more government you have, the less you're going to have for everything else. It's a drag on the economy. It's a weight. It's, not, it's a dead weight on the economy. The marketplace is the best place for those decisions when consumers making individual choices every day with their dollars they spend. And then you don't need that drag on the economy of having planning boards. And when you have planning boards, that means someone's sitting around and thinking about, someone has to then decide who's going to go to school, who's going to learn what trades, right? It's taking that, that decision making out of the hands of the control of people, right? Going against the violation of the, that violates what Adam Smith said, that one of the things you got to have for capitalism is the ability to act in your own best self-interest. But when you have the state saying, determining, well, how many people can go to this school, how many people can go to that school, which people are going to go, now that's taken out of their control. And just like when, uh, and when the state determines, well, this is, we're going to devote so much production towards cars and so much towards shoes and so much to towards boats or satellites or whatever, again, they're, they're taking those decisions out of the hands of the people, out of the marketplace. That is authoritarianism. That is why all forms of socialism fascism, capitalism, they're all totalitarian. They all end up being totalitarian. And the best thing I can suggest to do is to read The Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek. And he, he lays it out much more eloquently than I do. But that's, that's why, you know, that, that's, you know, so that's that. Uh, now, this business about globalization being an enemy to, to the worker or to individuals, bullshit. Adam Smith said, the, the three the three things you need for a successful capitalist economy, right? The, the ability to act in your own best self-interest, uh, the ability to uh, enter into uh, contracts, uh, and you've got oh the uh, freedom uh, that's part of the self-interest, and then uh, the vision of labor, I mean, specialization in other words, and then number three, when you specialize, you become super productive. You have to then do something with your excess, your surplus stuff you've made then you can trade it. And so you have to have free trade. So because of, uh, you know, because of globalization, I can take advantage of the, of, the, uh, of the specialization that people have achieved throughout the world doing various things, and I can buy, uh, you know, products that are, have extreme utility to me for, for very low prices. Matter of fact, just the other day I bought, uh, I bought a lighted jeweler's loop like about a 30 or 40 power jeweler's loop with a little switch on it and a light, shipped, made in China, but you know, shipped to me for like uh, like three or four bucks. Perfect. Plastic shit. A really useful <laughs> thing. And you know what? Actually, it's uh, it's actually it's actually made out of metal. It's actually made out of metal. And uh, so anyway, well, we can take advantage of these, of these things, and uh, and that's better for us because when we have lower prices. Uh, then we have more money to spend on other things, which raises, you know, the economy overall. Well, by the way, I've been hearing uh, Gene Horcher talk about this book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, for about 11 years. I didn't hear you mention it. And finally today I stopped at a thrift store on the way here, and I was browsing through there, and I saw this. For 99 cents, I picked up, so I look forward to reading it. Hope it's as good as you make it out to me. Okay. Uh, well, well. Sure. You know... I think it's all about uh, freedom. That's what we want. Most of us consider freedom to be the highest good, if you would use that term. Well, uh, as Bob here stole my thunder in part, I'm talking about Adam Smith. From the day I first read Smith, back when I was in high school, I saw it immediately that he was arguing for freedom because he was coming out of a system of fixed prices an organized society called mercantilism at the time. Mm -hmm. It was a way of exploiting the people in India and other parts of the British Empire and keeping their surplus value. And while it definitely did raise the standards of the British people, it did it by exploitation. Now Marx was definitely right that surplus value, the difference between cost and value to society, is uh, stolen from the people in a certain sense. <coughs> However, uh, uh, that fails in part when you consider that uh, 
there will always be a need for capital. In communist and socialist societies, the government takes the surplus value in advance. They don't give you it to payroll, and then you, you voluntarily risk it in the marketplace. They just take it. They do it in China today. I saw it when I was there four years ago. They've always done it. Freedom is the goal. If I think that I want to buy a pair of shoes that are of yellow leather, I want to be able to do it. And as long as that has utility to me, I will sacrifice since I have a limited income, and people will always have limited incomes. Uh, I will sacrifice, if necessary, uh, a trip to um, Disney World. I choose which expenditure has the highest utility to me. Right. And that's what's important. Yep. Yeah, and fuck everybody else. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, not, only, not only does capitalism produce freedom of thought, freedom. Uh -huh freedom of the individual and choices made in the marketplace because there is a governing mechanism that capitalism has on all of us and it's called price. When you when you put a value on something because of how much you're willing to pay for it. And even with our religion, we in this country have our freedom to believe what we want to believe and do what we want to do. For example, tomorrow I'm going to be at Schomburg Christian Church, where about four to five hundred people are going to be involved in a uh, praise and worship session, where I'm going to be helping to tape a little bit. And I myself have found that the Christian faith has really helped me out as an individual. I'm not going to say anything bad about the speaker here, but that's just been my own perception of what has happened with it. It's been a very enlightening and a very... Uh, very liberating experience for me to find God and to attend church again. But again, I made that choice on my own. I believe I've weighed the evidence in support of it, and I do believe that there is an eternal God out there. The point that I'm really trying to make is that one of the reasons we have these freedoms in our country is because of the sacrifice of a lot of people for the ideas of free speech, freedom of religion, and in some cases, freedom not to worship or not to do things. The best way to have a free marketplace of ideas is let them all flourish. Let them all come into a, a point and let the people choose where they want to go and what ideas they want to find. Now you will find that if you take a good vast look at the ideas that are espoused, especially in the Christian faith, we have such institutions here as Willow Creek Community Church. We have such things as Harvest Bible Chapel out in the suburbs that has like sevens and hundreds of satellite operations around the area. We have our Catholic Church, we have the Baptists, we have tons and tons of even mosques and other things. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Villa Park out at the mosque out there, but I was one time and it was one of the most uh, moving services I've ever attended. But the only reason we're able to do this is because of our First Amendment, because of our ideals committed towards freedom, and the freedom of each individual to believe what he wants to believe. And I do believe that the, one of the fundamental advancements upon society is the freedom that's exhibited in the marketplace. The freedom to make an idea, the freedom to fail and go bankrupt, and the freedom, <laughs> freedom to prosper. Yeah. Yeah. When, a company, when a company go, when a company cannot produce the goods or services that, that's required or not needed by an individual or a government or whatever, they should go bankrupt and not be bailed out as we've seen in the previous administration of Wall Street or too big to fail. Sometimes, though, when an industry is big, it may require some extra venture capital funding, which is what I believe the government did with Ford and some of the motor companies. But in return, they were also told, get, your, get back to being competitive and get back to what you want, to what the people want to buy. What's also happened is that there's a smaller market share and a lot of the foreign cars coming out right now. 
what I, what I really believe in myself is that our society has been raised by the principles of Adam Smith and capitalism, and ideally it's going to be solved by those very same forces. We just heard two weeks ago a gentleman who had, I believe, a way out of our current economic dilemmas by reinventing a nuclear power. And I'm not going to say what, you know, I'm not going to claim to be an expert, but from what I looked, he had some very good ideas as to how to move forward. I also know, too, that there are several companies producing wind and solar power, and as people want those things and buy them because they're cheaper and will make more sense, we're going to eventually get our environment cleaned up. With that, capitalism, freedom of the marketplace rule, so does the freedom of ideas and our First Amendment rights, protected by the government. <laughs> let's go to Frank. Let's go to a Jesus Jam tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> the Jesus Jam. Yes. You really <laughs> are <laughs> the big one. <laughs> Under just about any system you can think of. <laughs> yes. And I think that there was a whole lot more freedom for. Most people under capitalism than there had been under feudalism. So people were free to move around. And they were free also to starve if they were not employed. Uh, and so they would submit voluntarily. They were free to alienate their hours of labor uh, to the capitalists uh, who would tell them not to talk and to just attach themselves to his machinery or her machinery as the case might be. And to work harder and longer hours because the capitalists to, had to compete with other capitalists uh, to make more money. And the employer uh, therefore had planners who uh, told, told us what we would consume and how much we would pay for it. Uh, and what the obsolescence of the uh, con consumed articles would be. Uh, that's the system we live in, um, or live with, uh, but it, it, there are some limitations uh, to the freedoms of capitalism. Overcoming those limitations is what our freedom movements are all about. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that there are all sorts of oppressions, oppressions of women, oppressions of gays, oppressions of uh, of blacks, of, uh, of people of color generally, and there are oppressions of war and preparations for war. There are rather high taxes uh, on most people. Most people pay taxes if they're employed a good deal of their pay goes for uh, Social Security and for uh, uh, other things that many of them will never receive because they'll die before they get it or because, but of course others will live 
and uh, get more uh, the, because they live longer. Uh, and we're all living longer. That's why the um, disability rights uh, the fight for human dignity is very important, and I urge people uh, to go to the uh, news and letters, a Marxist humanist organization, uh, to hear the speakers uh, for the uh, rights uh, for disability, uh, uh, Tom Wilson, Ronnie Patrick, and Suzanne Rose. Uh, they are uh, associated with Access Living uh, and uh, a mother uh, of a person with disabilities, a member of ADAPT. Uh, they're not all Marxist humanists, but they have learned something from uh, Marx and, and the struggle for freedom. Boy, you can call that Jesus. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank our speaker here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. I, I didn't even make many notes here. I, I really don't know um, if, if the these heavy German philosophers have much relevance to people in, in the United States. Um, I mean, this thrust of history and things of that nature. Um, I don't know how they relate to our, our own political, uh, philosophical makeup, and I don't know if they really do. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I'm rather intrigued, though, to okay. learn at the World Parliament of Religions that we theologians were able to arrive at truth by voting. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were that simple. I think you usually have to apply some criteria, a test or measurement of some sort, use some data, but I guess you can just vote on it. Good. Uh, it, uh, a lot of this thing about, I know you were talking about how we deal with the, you know, this, this theology it has no relevance whatsoever. We reside in a secular humanist nation. Uh, certainly religion and theology is a part of the body politic, so is the NRA and the gay rights movement, and a thousand other entities, the IVI, whatever. So dealing with the authority of the church is no different than dealing with authority as we do in all of our relationships. I don't perceive why dealing with religious authority is any different than uh, the authorities we deal with at places of employment that I have to deal with. Um, but I, we live in a secular nation, and I don't really care anything whatsoever about Jesus jams, the essence of Christianity, the trumpet of the last judgment, uh, yada yada yada, the life of Jesus. I missed out on that one. Uh, but no, we we have. We have made a decision in this nation that we will establish a structure like the French guys did, and they subsequent to that, that we were going to let this exist. If, if, if it wants to have some impact upon people's lives, that's their choosing. In the body politic, uh, we've been successful in the separation of this, and it's, it's really, we try not to allow it to influence our policy decisions nationwide. Now regarding, there seems to be a lot of discussion here about collectives. And there's different
different kinds of collectives, and collectives can be very beneficial. Um, there's hierarchical collectives in which one individual is in charge, in which exploitive capitalism seems to have, where you have a CEO in charge of a multinational corporation and exceeds too much authority. Uh, is it efficient? Most assuredly it can be. Uh, the other collective is a more egalitarian collective. And that's what we try. I saw the other day, I saw a documentary where this big militaristic looking beetle was going along through the forest floor and it entered ant territory. And without any instructions whatsoever from any authoritative figure in the ant colony, this beetle was not only immediately attacked from all sides, but they killed him and consumed him. So, and they did this all very egalitarianly. Now there are other aspects, and I all might know this, I've studied some of the comparative psychology of the animal kingdom and things like that, you can get arguments about nature and so forth. There are many, many instances in which organizations, in fact, collectively work. The college complexes, in fact, is the collective which has worked for over 50 years. I'll have you know, sir, without ever having once even a meeting. Because we all have a vested interest in its operations and we see the merit of it. And over the years, so many people have seen it persevere without any. So your example, Bob, is a lot of Louis. I'm sorry. Because good can come out of about collective effort. There's, a, there's another thing about organizing a union. You can have old-fashioned unions where they're hierarchical. You vote people in charge and so forth. And there's other ones where they call it the collective organizing type of model in unions where the people come together and in a common interest in the workplace, and that's why they call it organizing and things like that, community-based things. And those are considered the ones that are really effective and don't get in their way. And the military tries to do this, formation of units and battle conditions. They, that's why they have this buddy system and thing, you know, this kind of stuff. I don't really even know that much about it. But anyhow, it's an interesting topic here. Um, I really don't totally concur that there's this dilemma, I'm a lefty, that I have all this dilemma here with my libertarian things like that, but it's worth pursuing. I'll watch for it in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and anyhow, thank you very much. Well, I think I have some idea how the speaker feels he probably is going to have some idea how I feel because I don't know how many times I put out things here, done speeches that are a little too abstract for everybody. And yeah, even, even stuff that I put out over years, you still won't get. You did some like we can't get. It's too hard. And uh, maybe it's a good thing. Well, I hope we don't get too many people from that. Uh, uh, Bunkhouse Square thing today because they're doing a lot of heckling and sometimes that gets out of hand around here too. But anyway, uh, we talk about redistribution of wealth. I, uh, one of the things that has apparently gone over everybody's head around here is that classic redistribution of wealth, like in Marx's Ten Planks, is taking from everybody and giving to that, it's that it's taking from the 99% of the 100% actually and giving to the 1%. And uh, uh, I think collective judgments basically the blind following the blind. And I don't think we have that much of a collective judgment here at the college of complexes. It's a little too anarchistic to for a collective judgment. Well, he's just agreeing about everything. It's not a collective judgment. But, uh, 
I'll be glad to see the day when the union works out some of its contradictions and elevates to a higher consciousness, which is kind of what I've been trying to get to get in the world. Maybe I'll have to do a speech on uh, working on the contradictions of unionism sometime. compared to medieval Europe, but in, an, in some other ways it's really still just as religious as it was then. I mean, there's a, there's a slow and surreptitious process of secularization. This was going on at the, the uh, religion just hides. It's more surreptitious now. It, it still permeates life to a much greater degree than most people realize. And that is the source of the problem, how religion hides from all of us and where the solution lies in identifying these surreptitious hiding places that both capitalism and socialism harbor. That's really it. Are you headed in my general direction? I need to have a card on that. No, I'll go a bus pass. All righty. Exactly. Yeah. They need, they need something to. Uh, but they create. The religion created the need. Well, you can look up and see red. Because it's Philip. Okay. Because the person that they can't think of. Because they need God. They need God. Just give me your email. The dispatcher did. There were a couple articles on him some years ago. But he was at that Glen Crest Hershey going on uh, Tui Western for, I guess, a year or so ago. Oh, I used to go downtown. I used to go downtown. I wrote about 14 people in place. Okay, you won't get the good things on Earth, but by and by in the sky, you get your air. So it's, it's a form of a uh, mental course. It 
Well, well, I don't think there can't be a guy So, the last one. What are the chances of getting the trim towards 450? Yeah, yeah. 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 the yeah. 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 yeah.